Good morning. This is Thomas McQueen Allison, MD, with a discussion uh, for the Allison family reunion in particular and also why DNA discussion in general. So, how do we get back to 1700 or thereabouts? Um, without family records. Most of our family records go back about 200 years and that's about it. So here's our third slide out of 74 and <clears throat> this is the Allison Crest that we've been using in our family for at least 250 years, maybe 300 years now. Um, and up at the top, you'll see um, the head of an eagle, or perhaps it's a griffin, which would signify the mythic guardian of treasure or priceless possessions, a golden esquire's helmet below, and three talbots, now extinct white-colored Scottish deerhound-like scent dogs that were used for finding thieves in the border area of Lower Scotland and reportedly brought to the British Isles by William the Conqueror in 1066. Slide four just repeats what I just said, but you can take your time, you can pause it if you need to. <clears throat> now, how do we get similar surnames such as Ellison, Allison, Alliston, Belliston, Elliston, Edmondson, Liston, and Williston? Well, I believe that this place in which is Simple Castle, which is on the northeast corner of Loch Winnock in southwestern Scotland, is the origin of our family history. And Ellis Town, E L L I S T O U N, is this area around here and apparently also near uh, Renfro. Now, let's move on to slide seven. And so let's talk about our family motto for just a few moments. This is slide uh, which shows my wife and I in Roslyn Chapel, which was built by the Sinclair family about seven miles south of Edinburgh. And there's only one inscription in the entire ornately carved chapel, which um, is as follows. And <clears throat> what it says in Lombardic print or Lombardic script is Forte is Winu, Fortior is Rex, Fortior is Sunt Mulieris, Super Omnia, whence it Veritas. So Let's talk about that just a moment. <clears throat> um, and forte is winu means wine is strong. Next fortior es rex means stronger is the king. And then fortior is sunt mulieres, which are women, are even stronger. But above all, truth conquers or the truth will out in this particular form of syntax. So, <clears throat> um, where does this come from? Probably from um, from the Edris apocryphal work in the, in the Bible, Edris 1 or Ezra 1. And um, it refers to a story given by um, Zebubabel, and he says that the king asked his three or four bodyguards uh, to tell him what would be the strongest, and they were to write it down on a piece of paper and slip it under his pillow that night. And whoever came up with the best answer would be the person to then lead the Israelites back to uh, Jerusalem from Babylon 
where they'd been for two generations at least, perhaps three, uh, after Nebuchadnezzar came and, and conquered Jerusalem and took all the gold and treasure out of the temple back to Babylon with him. So the first guy says, well, wine is strong because <clears throat> a man will get drunk off wine and he'll just pass out. And then, so that's the strongest thing. The next guy says, nope, it's uh, the king is strongest because he can kill, he can say who to live and who's to die and who's to do what. And the third guy says, nope, it's women because without a woman there can be no king. So women are stronger yet and a man will kill his or sell his whole kingdom for the love of a woman. And the fourth guy comes in and says, nope, he says it's truth is the strongest. And so that above all would win would trump all the other answers and so King Darius said yep you win you get to take the Israelites back to um, Jerusalem and I will give you the keys to the kingdom and all the gold that was taken from you and so he en then goes on to enumerate all this and um, of course as I said earlier the Sinclairs uh, were crusaders they went to uh, Jerusalem during the Crusades and some people think they were digging around under the temple and found a bunch of gold. So this is uh, King James VI's um, two pence coin upon which he also puts the inscription Veritas Winsit or Winsit Veritas as the case may be. So, <clears throat> let's talk about how we get um, to um, certain types of DNA testing. So, the first slide here shows mitochondrial DNA, which is used by family tree DNA and family finder, as well as uh, by um, Ancestry.com. And so... So this, this is all well and good for two or three generations, maybe. You can tell who's, who might be related to you. Um, but let's look at this next slide, which shows that um, for each generation, you're, you're losing more and more DNA out of the mitochondria because they're going to decrease in number. You've got 50%, 25%. And so on, on down to your great, 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 great grandparents, which are 512 or 1 512, or your great, 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 great grandparents, which are 256. So that's one out of 256, and this breaks down after a while, this particular type of DNA testing, so that you can't tell who's who um, or after about three or four generations. This is just another uh, depiction of, of that and it shows you <clears throat> shows you the genetic rate of transmission and a little bit it's backwards from what we just looked at but here's you, here's your parents, there's um, your four grandparents and then your um, eight great grandparents and so on so that you get wind up with about five percent after one two three four five six seven generations or six generations so what about in males um, here we have the um, X and Y chromosomes and you'll see that the Y chromosome is much shorter than the X chromosome so <clears throat> Then we'll see that um, the tips of these different chromosomes are homologous reason, regions. In other words, they're um, very similar. And so in every mitosis and then meiosis, there's crossing over. But in 
meiosis, you have you have to go through this twice, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, you, in prophase, these uh, chromosomes will kind of bunch up and try and match each other, and then they'll transfer data or transfer genes back and forth. You cannot have meiosis occur properly if you don't have the crossing over. So this X chromosome has to contort itself to get in line with the tips of the Y chromosome. So <clears throat> these are called pseudo-autosomal regions and then if you're a female, the X chromosome you inherited from your father may contain segments from the pseudo-autosomal region of this Y chromosome, um, which is the chromosome he inherited from his father. Okay, maybe from dad's chromosome, uh, the X from mom, of course. And then if you're a male, the Y chromosome you inherited from your father may contain segments from the pseudo-autosomal regions of his X chromosome and the chromosome he inherited from his mother. This slide simply shows uh, the sex determining region and the difference in the types of, of um, the number of genes in the X chromosome, for example. Um, there are about 2,000 genes uh, as opposed to the Y chromosome, which has only about 29 or so on the tips of each gene, but then there are about 50 others in here. So how do we get from 46 chromosomes to 23 chromosomes? And um, of course 23 chromosomes come from the father, 23 come from the mother to make a total of 46. So what's the difference between mitosis and meiosis? We have skin cells, stomach cells, and they make, they divide whenever we get cut and so forth and help to heal those cells. But sperm and egg cells make gametes. And so how does that occur? Well, in mitosis, you may remember from, um, from your biology, you have different phases of, of mitosis, with prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and then in meiosis, you have to go through the whole rigmarole twice. You have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then you go through the whole thing again. Prophase 2, pro metaphase 2, anaphase 2, and telophase 2. But only one crossing over occurs in P1, or prophase 1. <clears throat> now, so how does this happen? you got 46 chromosomes and 40... Uh, 92 chromatids, which are, you know, it's 46 times 2, and then you, each of these go through mitosis, the first mitosis, and you get wind up with 23 chromosomes each, and then it goes through it again, and you wind up with 23 chromosomes and 23 chromatids times 2 for each parent, or each, each excuse me, each um, X and Y chromosome. So let's talk about DNA just a moment. DNA has um, a ribose sugar backbone on each side on the top and bottom and then you have base pairs which are single nucleotides. Okay? And so only guanine and cytosine purine and pyrimidines will hook up with each other. Same thing for adenine and, thi and thymine. They'll hook up together. Um, and that's shown in dark blue and light blue and dark red and pink for the guanine and cytosine. So, how does this help us? Well, abbreviation of single nucleotide polymorphism markers which are tested for in most genetic uh, tests these days when you uh, do say big Y 
or when you're doing when you're looking for a, a criminal most people test for the single nucleotide polymorphism markers and uh, they're like a single on off switch that was thrown at a particular moment in time and has not changed since and this is something we look for um, very um, easily uh, we could show you that um, you have an A and a T that you've got just comparing two base pairs we've got adenine thymine cytosine guanine but that's a variant and this this is type 1 this is type 2 so this is this would be a variation and that's what you call a single nucleotide polymorphism <clears throat> so then um, it was found that a certain sequence of these base pairs can um, be useful in more recent genetic studies uh, say a thousand years or so about the time surnames came into existence so these are, these are called short tandem repeat markers or STRs and um, these are some some of them are fastly mutating while others are pretty slow to mutate so let's look at an example and here's one GATA guanine adenine thymine adenine and it just gets monotonous repeating 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 and then this is an older style of, of genetic studies which show the lineup of this this subject versus this subject and we can see that they match almost perfectly so back to the benefit of SNP testing and we'll say that they supposedly um, more accurately depict the precise appearance of specific surnames among related males in a specific location um, and we'll get into that in a few minutes so let's talk about um, the different arbitrarily designated haplogroups and Adam we think was the first man and he lived in Africa about 200,000 years ago but so his tree divides into two main three main branches here and then other branches different types of a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T start developing. This doesn't show them all, but you can see that the we're trying to show here that the SNPs can get back to Adam 200,000 years ago, and the STRs can are more specific about the last thousand years or so, or 500 years. So, what happened? Well, Adam left, or his descendants left, and some of them went north, due north to Egypt, and they're E, there's haplogroup E. And then you had some others come up here into this region, and then back over here, and through the northern part of, um, or the central part of Russia, and that's where we think. Um, haplogroup R first appeared about 35,000 years ago and then R1A split off and went to the north northern areas of the Black Sea and then 25,000 years ago you had R1B develop in, in the Iberian Peninsula so then those people in this group R1B go up into north into Western Europe and into the British Isles now at the time um, there was a land bridge across the Atlantic global warming started back about probably 10,000 years ago and that raised the ocean levels and to where they are today so that it would be more difficult to make that that connection that move today <clears throat> so uh, this is just another depiction of the R1B subclades which then uh, wind up 
being mostly L21 when we get up here about 2100 years ago um, into um, Great Britain and Ireland. But I possess all of these um, 312, 27, 21, and DF27. Okay? So next we have um, R1B depiction here with the green um, showing the maximum concentration. And this is Iceland up here, which shows maybe 40%. Northern Scotland has probably a few more. But Ireland has the most. And Wales have the most concentration of R1Bs. Whereas when we look over here in, in northern, in the Norse regions of Europe, um, you have a great preponderance of I1 or Germanic. So <clears throat> here's our tree. And as I said, I mentioned earlier, you got these different designations that they use arbitrarily. R1B is M343, P25 is R1B1, uh, P297 is R1B1A, and so on and so forth. You can just read this yourself and see that we wind up down here in the North Atlantic group, which is L21 or M529, or R1B1A to A1A to C. And then in the next slide, this just shows a depiction of the concentration of L21, which is responsible in, you know, in part and mostly for our ability to digest milk and lactose after we're weaned. Most of the rest of the world's population does not have this, this uh, genetic variation. So <clears throat> then we look at R1B. Again, this is our group I allisons. And we're heavily concentrated in Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and to a lesser, slightly lesser extent in England. This shows um, the R1 map of Europe. And uh, again, we can see the highest concentration is in uh, Ireland and Scotland, with some others in Russia and southern Germany and so forth, and also Brittany. Brittany over here is, has a very high concentration, which makes sense because that was where the land bridge was, or very nearby. So next slide, we have, um, this is 39 of 74 now. Uh, this shows a depiction of haplogroup I. And uh, of course we're talking about Y chromosome. And so haplogroup I is primarily involved in Northern Europe, primarily Norway, Sweden, and Western Finland. Highest concentration. So let's look at at the next slide, which shows Family Tree DNA's Allison, Allison project, and it shows the first, um, first group, group A and group B, they think were Norse, okay? These people all claim to be Norse, and they've tested these people in, in Scotland. So that's group A and B only. Then you got C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, so on, uh, and then ungrouped. And you can look at this yourself on your family tree DNA uh, site. But <clears throat> genetic family I is the one we're, we're involved in. And you can see here's me, 58-13-10, Mr. Robert Allison, born 1750. And then this is, um, this is uh, David Wade Allison, who's earliest known ancestor is Thomas Allison, born 1722, died 1794. Um, then we have John Allison, uh, who is actually, this is Thomas E. Allison, 
with a little e. And his earliest known ancestor was John Allison, born 1753. And then we have Theophilus Allison listed for the other Thomas E. Allison um, as his earliest known ancestor. And he, his, his father is likely Andrew, this Theophilus. And this is uh, Thomas E. Allison that's in uh, St. Petersburg. This is the Thomas E. Allison that's in Tampa Bay, or Tampa. So let's talk about big Y studies for just a moment. And this is a big, what they call a big block tree, which shows the number of SNPs back to this region here. So we see that here, this is Benjamin James Allison, uh, 41377 <clears throat> and he's very he's a very close match to the Struthers family Butler and Mason family over here uh, but he still winds up being in our group then next door we have James Miller Ellison and he splits off somewhere around 17 SNPs ago which is which works out to about 500 and 1550 excuse me 1550 would be the birth of that particular common ancestor for him then we get into um, Stephen Allison whose earliest known ancestor was born 15 SNPs ago <clears throat> and we think that probably relates to about early 1600s then we have um, our group which is all the Thomases Thomas E. Allison in Tampa Bay Thomas E. Allison in St. Petersburg Professor Thomas E. Allison this is lawyer Thomas E. Allison Tom, the small in small letters and then me and I'm this is this is my match page so I'm matching with all these uh, different people in family tree designation 58262 so let's look at the big Y results um, and the SNPs and the STR results for me and how I compare with other people so here's Thomas E Allison my closest living relative uh, according to family tree DNA and there are four non-matching variants or SNPs. Then we get to Thomas E. Allison, which has six non-matching SNPs, but they both have five big Y STR differences. But you can see from looking at this, they keep changing the denominator. So every time they come out with a new test, uh, they'll move the bar a little bit so anyway that's that and then this is a, a slide of and you can zoom in on this if you like uh, after you pause it I'm not going to try and do it right this minute uh, but you can zoom in and see that uh, there are Allison's here and also um, Thompson over here is Alexander here Simple, Allison, and Simonton, Simon Town. Um, this area in here is right around Simple Castle, uh, or maybe a little further to the north there. But then you'll see another group of Allisons over here on the southern, um, just to the southwest of Glasgow. So <clears throat> we know that Larry Allison's family who has not done a big Y test, uh, claims his first, his earliest known ancestor is perhaps um, Thomas Allison of Greenock. And here's Greenock right here. And this just happened to show up on this test that we got, uh, this map that we got from Origines, or Origines uh, in Ireland and they've helped us 
uh, study our genetics. So next we're going to talk about um, a map of the castles in the area. And you can see that um, the Hamiltons owned a great deal of land in and around uh, Lenark, just to the west of it actually, northwest and south. And this area here is very near what we would call Elliston or Ellis Town. So we know that, that um, Leonard Allison Morrison's book tells us that uh, Lord Hamilton hid away the sons of, of um, Alistair McAllister, supposedly, after he was killed uh, during the Wars of Scottish Independence, um, in which the Bruce had some people on his side and Balliol had others on, on, on the other side. Well, supposedly um, our ancestor or the ancestor of uh, John and or Sean Allison and <clears throat> also Alexander Allison wind up um, in this area after being hidden away right smack dab in the center of all the Hamilton castles. So this one is difficult to see, but you can zoom in on it as well. And this goes through the different people that claim ancestors. You'll see that uh, group A and B <clears throat> up at the top are actually uh, haplogroup I or Norse. And many people claim that Summerled, who supposedly was the progenitor of our clan, uh, was Norse and they examined some um, DNA from a person buried in Iona, which is just to the west of the Isle of Mull, um, halfway, to, halfway to Ireland from Scotland, pretty much. <clears throat> and they claim that, that uh, Clan Donald does, that you have to be Norse to be actually a descendant. But they did allow me into the group, into the group as a uh, brown-black group, and you'll see this uh, if you look at, if you look at, you'll find my numbers in there if you find, if you look through there on the McDonald Project. Um, also, the McAllister Project has has us nowhere similar to any of the McAllisters. Now, let's talk about the history of um, Northern Ireland and there was a nine years war which preceded the plantation of the Scots in Northern Ireland and then 1610 to 1630 most people immigrated to Ulster from Lanarkshire um, from um, from southwestern Scotland we believe currently based on these genetic studies and so we have the Allisons going to the County Donegal, Londonderry area, whereas the Ellison family primarily went to County Down, which is a bunch closer and just south of Belfast. Uh, the Alexander family then left about 17, 1640 uh, to the eastern shore of Chesapeake Bay in Virginia, and then the English, British Isles, three civil wars occurred, or the wars of the three kingdoms, and at that point in time, there was a lot of activity in in Ireland, and many of the um, many of the uh, English people, English settlers who had come earlier were killed, um, whereas most of the Scotch Irish people survived. This is just another map which you can zoom in on and see what I've underlined here for you, various places, and you'll see that the Allisons appeared a couple of times in this area, near Loch Swilly, and then um, also near Loch Foil. And this is pretty much the, the area uh, which the Larry Allison's family winds up near Castle Derg. Rapho is right over here and uh, to the west in County Donegal. 
So this is helpful. This was uh, James Miller Ellison's Y DNA case study, and it shows, in fact, that they are listed Ellison right here uh, and county down, <clears throat> and also here with us in county uh, in the southwestern portion of of um, Scotland near uh, the town of Elliston. Now, how often do mutations occur? Probably, they they you know been several different studies. The McGinnis family mutates on average about 60 to 75 years, but others mutate in their single nucleotide polymorphism about once every 25 or 30 years, or once every generation. <clears throat> So this is just another depiction of the Allisons uh, on the western side near Loch Swilly and also the east side of, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the western side of Loch, uh, Londonderry Loch. And then the Allisons are here uh, to the south, some of them, but James Miller Ellison's family stayed in this area to the east and county down just south of Belfast. So again, let's look at some more history and you'll see that there were various acts passed around 1660 after Cromwell's death when Charles II took over again and expulsed uh, 2,000 ministers in England and 400 in Scotland from their churches and branded them as enemies of the state and then um, the Bloody Clavers, or John Graham, who was probably from southwestern uh, Scotland as well, um, Catholic, led a terror campaign under James II and basically drove more people out of uh, Scotland into Northern Ireland, and some of them left and went to America. Um, <clears throat> then... Uh, William of Orange came and um, wanted to help take over and, and get rid of James II and he and uh, his group of people came over in the Mountjoy uh, ship and broke the siege of Londonderry in which four to eight thousand Protestants died of starvation in the 105 day siege which, as I said, William of Orange broke with his Mount Joy. Um, 1690, Reverend John Thompson is born on the banks of the River Fool in Ulster. And um, then William of Orange wins the Battle of the Boyne, July 1, six, uh, 1690. And, um, but, and so the Presbyterians thought they were in good shape after that. But unfortunately... Um, William of Orange had difficulty getting a lot of his plans through Congress, through Parliament, and so uh, very little changed after that point in time. Then around 1715 to 1720, there was a severe drought in Ulster, and also at this point in time, all the land leases were up that the, the original settlers got in 1610 to 1630. And so the landlords raised the rent exorbitantly. Um, 1715, Reverend John Thompson immigrates with his family and the Crockett family into New York and had then goes south to lose Delaware for about 15 years on the side of an old Dutch whaling port where most of the poor immigrants came. Uh, which would be us, more than likely. And then he moved from there after about 15 years <clears throat> to Conestoga Township, which is uh, Chestnut Level Presbyterian, uh, just to the just to the east of Conestoga Manor. And in 1734, he presided over the split of Conewago Presbyterian from Donegal Presbyterian, uh, which was on the eastern side of of the Susquehanna River to the north of Conewago Creek and so then uh, and Conestoga Creek 
and um, so so then yeah. uh, we have the Presbytery of Donegal um, which formed in 1714 1715 and in 1698 um, there was a congregation uh, called Rainey, which presented a call in March 1698 to Mr. Thomas Craighead, which was the son of uh, Richard Craighead, uh, also Reverend at Londonderry. Prior prior to that, he may have baptized a William and a or christened a a William and a Thomas Allison in Londonderry. <clears throat> Alexander of Rapho served the edict at Mount Charles, one and a half miles west of Donegal, and um, that's the son of Reverend Joseph Alexander, Reverend James, it was, the son of Reverend Joseph Alexander. Um, so, James Alexander, as you may have seen yesterday, was um, pastor at the, at the Convoy Presbyterian Church in uh, near Rapo and there was a five mile rule which expulsed um, Reverend Alexander from from that particular church so this just is a depiction of the depth chart for Chesapeake on the west and Delaware Bay on the right or on the east side, this is a Northrop photograph or Northrop chart, and uh, you can see where Luz is right here, which I've written in red, highlighted, and you can see why they would stop there because it was the easiest place to get to after you came in off the Atlantic from a long trip, and you didn't have to continue to try and navigate through these shoals up further to the north to try and get to Philadelphia and Newcastle. So this is just a uh, another uh, depiction of a Google map from today showing Luz down here in this little cape, inside this little cape protected area for the boats to dock um, more easily than trying to get up into, into Philadelphia from there. And you see Newcastle up here just south of Wilmington nowadays in Philadelphia on up to the northeast. So after <clears throat> our ancestors came to the New World, they probably hung out in Newcastle area or um, the southeastern part of Pennsylvania, northeastern part of Maryland, and western Delaware. <clears throat> and you can see a Christiana Creek, which is where the Alexanders were. And then here's London Britain Township, which is where most likely our Allison ancestors were. Um, Thomas Allison died 1737. Um, Will says that he was a resident of this area. And... Um, so then we look up here to the northwest, and there's Conestoga, where the Simontons were in the early 1720s. And so let's zoom in on that area of the area just east of, of the Susquehanna River. And actually very nearby is the current town of Columbia, where my wife's parents live. So I've been to this region and I've been to Chickie's Creek and I've been or Chickasalunga Creek, uh, which is actually very near the, the Simonton's were on Chickasalunga Creek <clears throat> down in this area, which you see. So uh, how did our group uh, of five brothers get to um, North Carolina from there? Well, we think that they probably went west across the Susquehanna River, probably at Wright's Ferry or uh, very near Harrisburg, south of Harrisburg, and very near to Conestoga Manor. And so we think they just crossed there 
and you see Carlisle's up here just to the west between Yellow Breaches Creek to the south and uh, Conodo Gwinnett Creek, I think is how you pronounce it. But uh, that basically the northern river that is very circuitous empties into the Susquehanna River at Harrisburg. And um, then we go a little bit further west and we find Hopewell over here. The Hopewell community is where um, Alexander Craighead installed his father as um, his father uh, Thomas Craighead as the minister of the church. And um, so we think that this Hopewell church also was the origin of Hopewell church in North Carolina, uh, just south of the what is now the Iredell line. And um, so so we think that the, our Allisons, our group of Allisons, probably went as far west as they could get uh, near the headwaters of that creek so that they could uh, have a, a good water supply, a good, good source of water, fresh water without being contaminated by animals um, downstream. Um, you look a little bit further to the west over here, and you'll see um, a town or a place called Parnell's Knob, and then just to the south of that, there's Steele's Meeting House and McDowell's off to the left of that. Um, then to the south of there, uh, we found Peter's Township, just a few miles to the south of there, where the Samples and the Alexander families went as soon as Cumberland County was formed in 1750. So they, they left uh, Cecil County, Maryland, or near Newcastle, and went west um, to that area. And we know that, that Hezekiah Alexander married Mary Sample and was married by um, the, um, the elder Sample who was an elder in the church and was allowed to perform marriages at the time. So, um, again, I've already mentioned Craig, uh, Thomas Craighead was ordained, and he, the, in the records in, in, um, in Ireland, they don't know where he went, but he, he, he did go to America. He may have even been on the same boat with, with um, John Thompson. So <clears throat> then we have the 1733, our settlers crossed the Susquehanna and founded Hopewell Presbyterian Church near Newville, the Barons of York area in southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, and then we already mentioned Alexander Craighead installing his father as pastor of Hopewell Church in Hopewell near the source of Yellow Breaches Creek. And... <clears throat> Then um, the Battle of Culloden occurs in 1746, which results in mass evictions and murder of non-combatant Scots by the English army. And so that was another impetus of, of immigration from Scotland to Ireland and America, including the 1740-1741 severe famine that caused 400,000 deaths and also contributed to the third wave of immigration. So again, this is just another um, period map from 1730 to 1765 in South Central Pennsylvania, uh, showing Antrim here. There is some there are some Allisons that live there or lived there, and uh, but they are not of Group I. We do not think at this point. And then we have Hopewell, which I mentioned before just at the source of Yellow Birch's Creek, basically, which is where our five brothers left and came south to North Carolina in 1765 or thereabouts. Then um, <clears throat> 1749 to 1753, the four sons of Thomas Allison died 1737, 1738, 
Uh, James, Andrew, Thomas, and Robert received Granville grants in Anson County, which then becomes Rowan County out of um, North Carolina. Then 1750, as I mentioned, Cumberland County opened up to settlers, to settlers in Pennsylvania. And 1754 to 1755, uh, the North Carolina governors actively campaigned for immigrants to come south uh, west to Scotland to uh, Ireland and caused the fourth immigration wave to the New World. <clears throat> 1755, the Brannock is defeated near Pittsburgh. And um, so, so that is, is really a seminal event in American history, for the, especially for the, our pioneer ancestors, because... Um, the Shawnee, in particular, got very aggressive and came south, southeast, and started attacking settlements there immediately thereafter. Um, my fifth great grandmother was also involved in that in southwestern Virginia, and she was captured by the Indians and taken um, to the area near Cincinnati nowadays. And she walked her way back after several months after she escaped. Then in 1755, um, we know that Reverend Hugh McAdden crossed the Yadkin and rode 10 miles to the home of James Allison, who was probably the first settler there. And he was apparently at the junction of several roads and, and had a, had a um, trading post there. <clears throat> 1753, John Thompson dies on the site of what is now Center Church. After being born on the banks of the River Full, Ulster and died on the banks of the Catawba River, North Carolina. And that is written on his tombstone, or on his monument. <clears throat> 1755, Brannock defeat, as we said, uh, caused many of the settlers to retreat back east to Cecil County, Maryland, including our samples and Alexander's. So in 1750, this just gives you an idea of where the settlements were. Um, you can see that the Germans were um, there first in the 1740s, the Scotch Irish of Pennsylvania, uh, a little bit uh, also in the late 1740s. And you'll see Mint Hill here, which is probably where Troutman is, or near, very near Troutman today. Um, north of, of Mecklenburg, just north of Mecklenburg County. <clears throat> and that was 1750. Then we'll, we'll look at uh, the original Granville grants and we see uh, Robert Allison gets 480 acres. Um, Thomas Allison gets 640 to the south on Fourth Creek, on either sides of Fourth Creek. And then Andrew is just a little bit to the east of Thomas, and that was his Granville Grant in 1752 as well. So in 1756, after the defeat of Braddock in Pittsburgh and the start of the French and Indian War, um, <clears throat> Fort Dobbs gets constructed 27 miles west of Salisbury, North Carolina, and Governor Dobbs owned 200,000 acres on Rocky River and its branches which is nearby the Allison uh, Woods people um, that are descendants of William Allison and one of our five brothers. In 1758, Reverend Alexander Craighead was called to minister from near Staunton, Virginia at the time, um, and he accepted the call to come to Rocky River Presbyterian, which was in eastern Rowan County, which is now Cabarrus County, um, and formed very rapidly seven churches of the Presbyterian denomination in the area, the Pleiades, in other words. The Rocky River Church, Poplar Tent Church, of which my um, fifth great-grandfather and my fifth great-uncle, John Allison, were uh, elders. And then Hopewell, where the... Uh, where all the Alexanders and samples wind up. 
and, or most of the Alexanders, and, and not all of them. And then Providence, Sugar Creek, where my uh, great-grandfather was a preacher for a few years in the late 1800s, Steel Creek and Center Church are formed. So in 1758, Fergus Sloan sells his property for the Allison Cemetery to trustees of Fourth Creek Church, Thomas Allison, William, and Robert Simonton, and Sam Thornton. <clears throat> then you have 1760, the Battle of Cherokee, but with the Cherokee, at Fort Dobbs and Catawba Indians. The friends of the settlers are decimated by the smallpox epidemic. But I want to stress that the Catawba Indians were down to the south in South Carolina, what is now South Carolina, <clears throat> just over the line, and were, were terribly uh, hurt by smallpox. smallpox. Um, then 1761, Hugh Waddell was, was the um, colonel, I believe, and he led a campaign against the Cherokee in North Carolina and southwestern Virginia. 1763, the Treaty of Paris is signed and the French and Indian War went, ends, but then immediately thereafter, they weren't home free because Pontiac's Ottawa tribe <clears throat> rose up with the help of a few other Indian tribes and started in um, attacking the refugees on the west side of the of the. Um, Susquehanna River and drove them back across east into um, Conestoga Manor and and even further back into Cecil County, Maryland. So this is just another um, picture that shows the different Mecklenburg churches of Providence, uh, Philadelphia, Rocky River, Poplar Tent, Center, Sugar Creek, Hopewell, and Steel Creek. So, <clears throat> Bethany Church was formed in 1773, right before the beginning of the war, by 47 out of 200 families of Fourth Creek Church. And Thomas Sharp apparently led this group and met at the home of James Hall. Um, the halls were prominent in and around Conewago Settlement and Conewago Presbyterian Church in Pennsylvania on the east side of the Susquehanna, and we think that that may be uh, the origin of this, this group as well. <clears throat> now, 1771 through 1775, you had mass evictions of 25,000 Ulster Scots from County Antrim, by the Marquis of Donegal, and this caused the fifth wave of immigration from Ulster to America because the rent was exorbitantly increased. In April 1778, James Hall becomes first uh, full-time pastor of Fourth Creek Bethany and Center Presbyterian. He was also a graduate of Nassau Hall in 74, 1774, and um, became full-time pastor of Bethany Presbyterian in 1790 after establishing two classical schools in the 1780s, including Cleo's Nursery, at which our brother, um, master, schoolmaster Thomas Allison taught. Um, then this is just another um, picture of off the heritage of Iredell showing the, um, the Allison Woods here to the north, Bethany to just about two miles to the south, and then Statesville here. So just to review, <clears throat> the first county is 17, is Anson in 1750, or actually before 1750, and then was divided into um, Rowan in 1753 and Mecklenburg in 1763. Then Cabarrus became an offshoot of of um, Mecklenburg in 1792, and Lincoln became an offshoot of um, Tryon County, which, of course, 1779, when he, uh, during the height of the Revolutionary War, 
and they wanted to rename it and get rid of Tryon because he was the governor prior to the war. <clears throat> then we have a picture of many of the signers of the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence, which was signed in 1775, shown on this map, and kind of a, a nice depiction of Iredell County, Rowan County, and Mecklenburg to the south. Um, with Poplar Tent Church on the right, Caudill Creek, and Rocky River just to the west. Um, and if you follow Rocky River on up there, it'll, you'll finally get into Allison Woods. But over here to the west, you see, here's Richard Berry, who is my ancestor as well, maternal ancestor, and uh, William Graham, the brother of, of Sarah Graham, who married my Robert Allison. So next we have um, um, another map of, of the river system from 1762 in um, North Carolina, showing the different counties and when they were formed and so forth. So you'll see Rocky River, Connell Creek, and so on and so forth going on the east side of this map. We don't have a good will for either John or Robert Allison um, the records in Mecklenburg County and Cabarrus County were poorly kept or either um, they were lost in a fire, we think, perhaps, um, around 1800. And so most of the records were, were missing. But we do know from the records from Thomas Allison, who was son of my Robert, that... Um, his property was two miles north of Poplar Tent Church, which you see here, PT, and then TA is Thomas Allison, um, who had property on both sides of Collar Creek. And we, su we suspect that it was beneath Lake Howell uh, Reservoir at this point in time after it was dammed up. Um, you can't find the property anymore. So let's go back and talk about um, naming your children if you're a Scot or an Ulster Scot. And the firstborn child is usually named for the paternal grandfather. And I'm going to stop here just a second and just give you a profound revelation. We collaborated with Leslie Allison and uh, Ann Allison Kincaid um, in in um, Statesville area <clears throat> and we found that and as well as John Allison and we all we know that that uh, every last one of their um, first sons was named William so this leads us to believe that their father was probably a William and probably William the brother of Andrew Allison who was the half-brother, we think, of um, Thomas Allison of Statesville, born 1722, <clears throat> and died in 1794 in Iredell County. So then we see the second son born was named for the maternal grandfa grandmother, grandfather, excuse me, um, and then the third son would be named for the father. And the fourth and subsequent sons were named after their father or mother's brothers. Then you have uh, the daughters following a similar pattern, named for the maternal firstborn daughters, named for the maternal grandmother, secondborn daughter for the paternal grandmother, and third uh, for the mother. <clears throat> so this can help us um, to maybe find, or highly suggestive of finding, uh, an ancestor if we don't have any other records prior to the, the first person in the record. So... I'm going to try and and tell you a little bit about these these uh, spreadsheets here. Uh, the first column over here is me. I'm the reference because I seem to mutate more than anybody else in our group <clears throat> at 
one mutation every 1.2 generations. Then, um, secondly, we have um, Thomas E. Allison that, that lives in Tampa, the lawyer, and um, we see that, that he matches up almost exactly and generationally with me. And he is five uh, mutations out of 111, different from me. Then we go next door to Professor Thomas E. Allison, and he is, he lives in St. Petersburg, of course, and he is six out of 111 mutations, uh, different from me. Then we get into John Allison, who is Ann's brother, Ann Allison brother, Ann Allison Kincaid's brother, and he is six, um, six mutations, six S. I put SNP and it should be STR mutations different out of one eleven. So we think that this is a pretty good indication and works out to about um, seventeen fifty for me, seventeen um, seventeen. 20 or 17 thereabouts, uh, maybe 1709 for, for Professor Thomas E. Allison's earliest known ancestor birth, which would probably be Andrew, and then John, similarly, um, John Allison's earliest known ancestor is William, and he was the brother or half-brother of our um Robert and John that wind up in Poplar Tent. And, of course, uh, John, Allison's family, ancestors wind up staying at Allison Woods, <clears throat> just to the north of Statesville, about nine miles, uh, until about until about the 1780s or thereabouts, when his father, his correction, his, his great-grandfather moved to Statesville and built a nice home there. Then we have David Wade Allison, who is Leslie's brother, and he is eight mutations from me, distance from me. And this is also within line of a common ancestor, um, maybe Thomas. Thomas Allison died 1737, 1738. <clears throat> then you have Larry Allison, and we know that maybe Thomas Allison of Lanarkshire uh, was his earliest known ancestor. He has also eight STR mutations at Y111 from me, and James Miller Ellison, born 1740, uh, born, correction, born 1940. Um, his earliest known ancestor is a John Ellison, born 1800 in St. Field, Ulster. So there you have it. Uh, that's the all I've got to say at this point in time, I hope you enjoyed it and hope you have a great rest of your day.